Be informed. SMS your name to 0406 UMA. Shakoto ila wakiri su ahibdi. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله إمام الخلق والمسلين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خص إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر and it's with great pleasure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gathered us um, tonight in this beautiful uh, mosque of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, it's with great happiness that we have a celebrity tonight with us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not take away the celebrities of the ummah. And subhanAllah, if you look at the Western societies, ikhwani, their celebrities and the people that they look up to are on a different platform. They set the standards for their lifestyle. They give them something to do. They set a particular standard in a particular way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us Muslims, the ummah of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, the ummah to Tawheed, people to look up to as well, especially at, the, at times of hardship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never left a generation. Or, or an era without sending someone for this ummah to look up to. And tonight, Ikhwani, we have a man that lived in a time sim similar to our time. And lived in fitan, very similar to today's fitan. And lived in an era where the fitna of the West, or the fitna of money, or power, or name and shame, or worldly materialistics, or the intellectual fitan, they were all present at his time. Tonight, we are with no other, or none other, than Al Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Rahimahullah. One of the greatest men and the greatest scholars that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to this ummah, ikhwani. One of the greatest human beings to come and live on the face of the planet. Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. One of the greatest Muslims who held on to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically at the times of hardships. Because when everything's smooth sailing, ikhwani, what happens? If everyone's practicing the religion of Allah and everyone's on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everyone's teaching the Quran and the Sunnah and everyone's smooth sailing, you can't distinguish between people. But when the fitan happen, when the waves start rocking the boats, when the wind is pushing the boats left and right and centre, that's when you can tell who is more firm on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the rest. That's when you can distinguish the man from the boy. And just a brief introduction and a brief history of the time that Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah lived in Ikhwani. Just to show you the analogy, the comparison of the time of this great Imam and your time today. And how he held on to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how you should hold on to the religion of Allah. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came the Khulafa of Rashidin, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, as we all know. Then came ad dawla al amawiyya This city, or sorry, this state, it's a Muslim state, it had a Khalifa. It had the Qur'an, the Sunnah, as the Dastur, as where they get the ruling from, etc. They ruled, but a little bit different than the way that the Prophet has, and his Sunnah has passed, passed it on. They ruled in a way that the father will pass on the inheritance, including the Imara being the Amir to his son. And they'll pass on, and they'll pass on, and they'll pass on. At about 100 Hijri, a new Da'wah began to start amongst the Muslims. It's called a da'wah li ahli al-bayt. And it wasn't the da'wah, the, the call of the Shia. It was a different call of da'wah, ikhwani. 
It was actually started by a group of the Abbasiyin. The children of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, one of the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and his descendants, began to call for someone to rule the Ummah from the children of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and his family. And they became, began to spread that message. Within, it, within a few years, this strong Abbasi Dawah or Dawah al Abbasiyah was able to topple a Dawah or the Amawi state. And now we have replaced a Dawah al Amawiyah, the Amawi state, which was ruling basically the whole world back then, or the whole known world, to a Dawah al Abbasiyah. And initially, the Dawah al Abbasiyah was a bit pious, had religion, etc. And they all had religion, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, but the levels of religion is what we're talking about. Then we get the Khulafa of Adawa al Abbasiyah changing a little bit. We're talking about the most powerful human being on the face of the planet. One of Al Khulafa al Abbasiyin, Rahimahumullah, Harun al Rashid, he used to look up at a cloud, Ikhwani, and he used to tell that cloud, rain. Rain wherever you want to rain. Tomorrow, your fruit will come to me. That's how big his lands were. It was described that this country or this state, this Islamic state, that the sun is always yani, um, shedding light on it. Some parts of it will be day, some parts of it will be night. Can you imagine how big this state was? That once Harun al-Rashid rahimahullah, yani in a long story which we'll cut short, he told one of his wives, if you cannot, you're not my wife, if you can't leave my country by night. As in she needs to leave his country by night. And there was no way, she needed a few months just to leave his country. Can you imagine how big this state was? And then come the children of Harun al-Rashid. al amin wal maamun some of the most spoiled Muslims at their time. Well, alhamdulillah, they had deen, they had intelligence, they had the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they feared for the religion, they um, cared for the ummah, they cared for the affairs of the ummah, that was all there. However, they had something as well. They were born into such a spoiled state, ikhwani, that at the time that they came, and at the time that they were around, they were at luxury that one of their weddings costed millions of dinars back then, which is equivalent to millions if not billions of dollars. Can you do the math? Back when? At the time that people were so poor. Who comes at that time, Ikhwani, in the, bit, in the middle of all that? A young man gets married to a woman. And this pious woman gives him a child by the name of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. The father passes away while this child is at the age of three. Can you imagine the mother? She's in her early 20s or mid-20s and she's with an orphan child. She's got two choices. She could remarry at the expense of this child where he may not get you know, top priority, he won't be the most important person to her, etc. Because she's got rights to give to her husband and other kids. Or she can dedicate her whole life to him. And that was exactly what Ummu Ahmad rahimahullah did. A young woman in her youth, in her prime youth, left the whole world, Ikhwani, and dedicated her whole life to raise Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. What she raised him on, Ikhwani? And this is very important. What are we raising our children on? She received this baby. Her husband died at the age of three. She had him from the age of three onwards by herself. What did the Ummu Ahmad rahimahullah raise him on? The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The memorization of the Quran. The learning of the knowledge. The manners. The, the, the. And all that came from who? A woman, ikhwani. A very poor woman. That the moment that her son started to, you know, write with his hand, he actually had to go work. Rahimahullah. He had to go and work so he could earn some money just to cover some of his expenses. This is the mother of Ahmed, rahimahullah. Sacrificing her life so that her son can become a great scholar in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dedicating his time, his life, his energy towards the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its service. Ibrahim ibn Shammas, one of the great men back then, he said, Wallahi, by Allah, 
لاني اني كنت ارى احمد يقوم الليل وهو غلام با الله يست سي احمد 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 ابن حنبل when he was a child before even the age of puberty and just around the age of puberty this ahmed ibn hamad used to do qiyam al layl subhanallah today the brothers who want to go jihad and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open it are struggling to wake up for fajr and this child is waking up for tahajjud let's compare it akhi the ummah today is struggling with salat al fajr and he is ahmed ibn hanbal rahimahullah with no problems at in his childhood was raised on tahajjud ikhwani if we want to look at ahmed ibn hanbal rahimahullah we need to look at, look at him as a whole package you can't look at an incident of the time of ahmed ibn hanbal how was he patient in front of the ma'mun or how was he patient in jail or how was he patient as he was whipped or how was he patient with the whole ummah let him down we can't look at that we need to look at this plant how it was planted we need to look at this tree what seed it came out of and what was it watered with look at ahmed ibn hanbal rahimahullah like one of the greatest scholars of islam so much so that some of the scholars of islam would call him imam ahli sunnah the imam the scholar the greatest scholar of ahli sunnah wal jamaa can you imagine your worship to him at the age of 14 we have a young man his mom alongside the quran and the sunnah and the adab and the manners etc she actually taught him taught him a skill and this skill ikhwani taught him self consciousness and fear of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to work and earn his own money so much so that even later in his life he'll be so poor and he would not extend his hand asking people for help people will offer him the khalifa the workers of the khalifa baytu mal al muslimin you know the workers people off the street his family his friends would offer him money and would refuse it and would rely on but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and here he is at the age of 14 ikhwani where, where does he give a job subhanallah there wasn't many job vacancies back then the job that ahmed ibn hanbal rahimahullah was able to do since he was a good writer here he is writing the letters of the khalifa and the officials back then back then they didn't have you know your emails or your text messaging or your um, skype or whatever we we're using today viper they used to have offices and the letter will go to this office from the khalifa or the official government official and the letter would say to all the muslim countries and all the muslim cities al umal wal wula we're talking about hundreds of them in every city and every town and this letter has to be written so many times told them to you know let people off tax here or that you know we will uh, declare jihad on this country or whatever it is we're saving up money to build a mosque or a large institution whatever their case may be so here he is writing the letters which are going to the ummah reading letter by letter and sometimes a letter will come orders of the khalifa or orders of the muslim officials and the order will be for, to do something haram or to do something wrong any person that you know delays his zakat or whatever something that's not in the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran or the sunnah or any person that for example does a particular crime or says something against the khalifa execute him without you know um, looking into the matter what have you as it was known by Bani Abbas rahimahullah may Allah forgive them and forgive so many Muslims including ourselves they used to kill especially initially بالضن, as in if they suspected that you were against the system against the state they'll execute and kill you that was something that was widespread back then so Imam Ahmed rahimahullah began writing the letters for the Khulafa and here he is if there's an execution or something that's haram or something against the book of Allah or the son of the Prophet he would not write it and who disobey the orders of the writers as much as that could have got him in trouble and he could have been tortured before etc Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him from it if anything they increased their love for him that this person actually fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ikhwani as he progressed between the age of 14 and 16 supporting his mother supporting the Muslims at the age of 16 a young man ikhwani began one of the longest journeys on the face of earth 
till the day of judgment. Can you imagine at the age of 16, Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah picked up his pad, picked up his pen, picked up his book and began the journey of knowledge. And ikhwan, his journey of knowledge is not like mine and yours. Sitting underneath electricity, electricity or um, you know, lightning with a, bit of a, with a microphone, with a camera, with, you know, if, if you miss out on the lecture, it's recorded, it's placed on YouTube, and you know, it's, it's um, live. No, ikhwani. Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah began in the poorest of conditions, where he would have to travel on foot. He didn't even have an animal to ride, a horse or a camel. He would have, have to travel on foot for so many days of his life. He was called the traveler. So much so that he went Hajj so many times, three of them, and he was living in Iraq, in Baghdad, three of his Hajj was on foot. Can you imagine a man walking for thousands of kilometers between countries? Today, if we hear of a man going on motorbike, we say, what a hero. Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah walked for months and months and months just to do Hajj. And in the journey of Hajj, who would learn from this Imam and who would listen to this Shaykh and who would go and ask for a Hadith. So much so that he was known at his time to be the Hadith collector. And he began his collection at the age of 16, Ikhwani. Where he would not hear of a Hadith. He would ask around, who has a Hadith? Who has a, a, a Hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam? He would not hear of a Hadith that he would not go and collect it. So much so that once he went to receive Hadith from a man and the man didn't want to open his door. So Imam Ahmad rahimahullah stayed sleeping and spending the time outside this man's door for two days just to hear one hadith. His book has thousands of thousands of thousands of hadiths and he is one hadith taking two days off him, sleeping outside one man's footsteps or one man's um, doorstep as they say. That's just one hadith, akhwani. At the age of 16, as he began in Baghdad, within a few years, he compiled all the knowledge of Baghdad. So he moved on to Al-Basra. Then he moved on to Al-Kufa. These are cities within Iraq. And it will take you weeks just on foot. And he's Al-Imam, rahimahullah, a young man, Ikhwani. And I'm talking to the youth. Please, brother, if you want to reach the age of 40, 30, 40, and 50 and start gaining knowledge, and you, you want to delay knowledge till then, Akhi Wallah, you're risking it. What guarantees you, first of all, that you'll live till then? Second of all, your youth is your prime production time. It's a time that you can produce so much in it. Why are you delaying your knowledge till you're old? He's Al Imam Ahmad Rahimullah, starting at the age of 16, touring the Muslim countries and the Muslim cities one by one. And one day, as he performs Hajj, and after the season of Hajj, he sits down and listens to one of the greatest scholars in his time, Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And he was no, this is a scholar that people will come from all around the world just to listen to his lectures and talks. People and Muslims will come from all around the Muslim world just to learn from this great man. And here is Al Imam Ahmad rahimahullah with his friend who was also named Ahmed, sitting down listening to Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And as they were sitting, they used to notice a different halaqa. And al haram al Nakif, for those who haven't been there, يعني, there's, there's four sides to it. You could have so many halaqat in it. And the history of Islam is known to have so many different halaqat, circles of knowledge, depending on whatever field you want to specialize in. You'll have a circle for hadith, a circle for fiqh, a circle for ibadah, a circle, and so on and so forth. So they used to notice a different young man. Sufyan ibn Ayyayna rahimahullah was very old. And he's a young man teaching. He was al-imam shafi'i rahimahullah. So Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he was known to have good judge of character. He would look at a person, it was, it's called al-farasa. And uh, subhanAllah, Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah was even known to, uh, to have that as well. Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah looked at the Shafi'i and he told his friend, let's go and sit in that person's halaqa. Let's go and sit in that person's lesson. So he told him, you're leaving, you know, like the 80 year old man, the big mama as they say, for this young man, for this guy. He said, 
if, he, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you life, you'll see what this young man becomes. And he becomes a Shafi'i rahimahullah. One of the greatest scholars of Islam. So here is Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah studying underneath a Shafi'i. And he took from him and took from him. And a Shafi'i rahimahullah loved him in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although they're actually two different madahib. And they used to always sit there and discuss their differences. But how did they discuss them? With so much respect. With so much brotherhood. With so much love. That they used to, yani, rahimahumullah, they used to speak so highly of each other. That sometimes you think, is it, is it true that they love each other? Can someone love someone so much? He's a Shafi'i, rahimahumullah, once going to Iraq, later. And he looked around. And he leaves Iraq and he says, Taraktu Baghdad, I left Iraq and I left Baghdad. And I, live, ne I never left anyone. I haven't left anyone behind me as much as knowledgeable, as God-fearing, as high as Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. Can you imagine? He, that's what Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah says about Ahmad. And then you got Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah saying that any student out there, any person with a pen or any person with a paper gaining any type of knowledge, or something to Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. Can you imagine the love, the respect that these two had? And I pass that on, Ikhwani, specifically to our brothers, who sometimes get involved in arguments and dialogue, which is first of all an Islamic. It's nice to discuss things. It's nice to enjoy the difference of opinion. But Ikhwani, if Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah and Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, they agreed to disagree. On the minor, you know, minute things. They agreed to disagree with all respect and manners. Who are we, a thousand four hundred years later, coming to agree with this and uh, to coming to disagree with no manners? Let us learn from the sources, Ikhwani. So here he is Ahmad ibn Hanbal traveling within Iraq and he gained the whole knowledge of Iraq in a matter of years on foot. I say this to the brother who might live five minute walk from the mosque and his car sometimes doesn't turn on, so he doesn't come to the mosque. Akhi, on foot. He walked for years on foot. I say this to the brother who sometimes wakes up in the morning, he might have a lesson or he might have free time, he could study and he could learn something. He could memorize a verse, he could teach someone the Quran, he could increase his knowledge and he's too lazy. Look at, look at Ahmad ibn Hanbal at the age of 16, Akhwani. Where are 16 year olds today? Where would you find them? So he finishes, he gains all the knowledge of Ahl, Ahl Baghdad, then Al Iraq. Then he goes to Saudi Arabia, he goes to Mecca and Medina and gains the knowledge there. Then he goes to Yemen. And subhanAllah, he went to Yemen just to meet a man and gain his knowledge. And the interesting thing is, he was telling his friend in Hajj that I'm going to Yemen to learn from so many scholars, specifically this scholar. And in Hajj, in Tawaf, around the Kaaba, they see that man. So his friend was very happy. Because Ahmad ibn Hanbal made his friend walk with him all that time. So his friend was happy saying, Alhamdulillah, would I have to walk all the way to Yemen? You know, another few months on the road. He's the man that, you, you know, we're, we're, we were looking for. He's the man we were going to travel for. So Ahmad ibn Hanbal told him, La wallah. Al ilmu yu'ta. That you go to knowledge. Wala yati. And knowledge doesn't come to you. So then what do you mean? He's the man. I'm not walking to Yemen. So he convinced him to walk with him to Yemen after Hajj and they walked it. Walking, akhi. Not in a car, not in a plane, not on a ship, not on a bus. Walking. For months and months. See when we say Imam Ahlu Sunnah al Jama'ah. See when we say the word Imam, has he earned it or not? And he was doing it all sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Gaining all that knowledge, ikhwani. And wallahi, when I came to compile a list of his teachers, I looked at the number of teachers of this man and I, subhanAllah, I started to yani, be amazed. He had so many teachers. And he's one of the greatest scholars of Islam. So much so that even when he was very old, and very frail, and very, one, in a very old state, in a very sick state, in a diseased state, 
He was gaining knowledge. So one of, his, one of the people around him told him, Ya Imam, ila mata? When are you going to stop gaining knowledge, Ya Imam? Don't you think you have enough knowledge? So this old frail man, Ahmad ibn Hanbal told him, Min al mihbara ila al maqbara. From the, you know, the little ink, they used to have sticks back then and they wet it with ink. Al mihbara, the ink parlor, if you want to call it, that they would draw it on. He said, From that to my grave. And that's what happened, subhanAllah. He continued to gain knowledge to the day that he died. Some of his teachers will include Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, the student of, uh, of um, Abu Hanifa, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, Al Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahimahullah. Although Ahmad ibn Hanbal had a difference of opinion with these people, he still gained knowledge from them. SubhanAllah, what a lesson to learn. He had a difference of opinion with Al Shafi'i and he still gained knowledge from him. With um, Abu Hanifa and his students, and he still gained knowledge from them. If anything, he gained also respect from them. Ikhwani, it's something, wallahi, and it's a message that we need to learn how to live with our differences. And need to learn how to live and learn from those that differ with our opinions. Just because you come from a different school, or a different mosque, or a different madhab, it doesn't mean that the other brother is going to Jahannam, aliyadu billah. It doesn't mean that per a person from a different madhab or a different school of thought is on a dalal al mubin Akhi, if Imam Ahmad rahimahullah was able to learn from al-Shafi'i, from the students of Abu Hanifa, who are me and you not to learn from each other? And here he is, ikhwani, gaining knowledge day by day. And he spent, as I said, from the age of 16, and he started at the age of 16, and he did not stop till the age of 35, 36. 20 years of gaining knowledge. Specifically the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Today, wallahi, and it's with shame that I say this, Muslims would start to gain knowledge. The brother will enroll in a 10 week course, two hours a week, or three hours a week. Week one, he's very energetic, he's there at the front line. Week two, he's still there. Week three, He's there, he was five minutes late. Week four, he was half an hour late. Week five, Assalamu alaikum wa the brother's gone. Five weeks would not last. And he's Al Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, lasted for 20 years. And would not last under, under the most luxurious of conditions. And, and Al Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, had the most harshest of conditions. Would it be the fear of the state was there? Would it be poverty? It was there. Would it be people not wanting to give him knowledge? It was there. Would it be traveling and the hardships of traveling? It was there. Would it be the lack of money? It was there. This man, rahimahullah, back then, the age, the age they used to get married at, is between 20 and 30. Ahmad, rahimahullah, to delay, delay his marriage till 40. Why would he sacrifice it for ikhwani? Anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here we have one of the greatest scholars of Islam. Between the ages of 35 and 40, after spending 20 years in gaining knowledge, he spends five years in writing the book, one of the greatest books written in the history of Islam. Musnad al-Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. And I know that some of us may not connect to these words or connect to a name of a book. All I can tell you, akhi, all I can tell you, sister, is that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah spent 25 years, a human being spent a quarter of a century compiling this book. That's all I can tell you. It's a book, yeah. But it's a book of the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a book of the best creation created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a book to preserve the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At a time that the fitan began to start, and I spoke earlier about what happened with Ad-Dawla Al-Amawiyya, then Ad-Dawla Al-Abbasiyya, which came and took over. Ad-Dawla Al-Abbasiyya, Ikhwani, was one of the peak states in the Muslims, in Muslim history. And it had a lot of good, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And one of the good things that the Abbasiyyin were able to do, Ikhwani, is introduce free trade. Where they would, you know, reduce taxes, allow people to come and trade with the Muslims, allow the Muslims to go out there and trade. Walhamdulillah, that, that increased the economy. 
um, the upgraded the economic status of the Muslims. And with too much travel, Muslims began to see different and new cultures. So now you've got Muslims going to Spain, got Muslims going to Greece, Muslims going to you know, Rome, Muslims going to different cities, and vice versa. You've got Romans, you've got Greeks, you've got um, uh, people from Spain, you've got people from all over the world come to the Muslim empire to buy and sell from them. And with the interaction with people, and with the new Muslims coming in, you had a few fitan began. And it was, it's unfortunate to say that the state back then was too busy expanding and not rectifying the problems that occurred. One of the problems that took place, for example, is a person will come into Islam and he used to worship a particular idol. He would come into Islam and it's known no idols in Islam, etc. However, he'll start, some people done this, where they'll start mixing some parts of the old religion with Islam. And the Muslim state would find comb these people, educate them. If these people start, continued on their dalala, obviously they will treat them the way they should be treated. However, some of these people managed to penetrate the system. Hide their ideology. Hide their fitan. Hide their misconceptions. Pretend that they're Muslims and start a new ideology within the Muslims. One group is called Al-Mu'tazila, for example. This group, Ikhwani, started towards the end of al amawiyin They began with so many fitan. They would ask questions about the Qur'an, they would ask questions about Ali and Muawiyah, they would ask questions about the companions, they would ask questions about the Prophet ﷺ himself, they would ask questions about, you know, in aqidah, in fiqh. And the scholars of Islam sat them in their place and hold them back. However, whenever a war takes place, whenever there's a fitna between the Muslims, these groups emerge and they'll come out. And these groups will be able to spread their fitan because no one is actually spending time to put them back in their places. And this group, particularly Al Mu'tazila, were a bit more integrated than the other groups. They decided to work on the Khalifa and the people surrounding the Khalifa. And they managed to penetrate at the time of Al Ma'mun. And we say, Rahimahullah, he's one of the Khulafa of the Muslimin. We say, Rahimahullah, he was one of the leaders of the Muslims. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. Just like Imam Ahmad rahimahullah asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive this man. This man, the son of Harun al-Rashid, born into a very spoiled family, with khair, with a lot of good. However, a lot of spoiledness, a lot of free time, and with that comes trouble. He began to read the books of the Romans, of the Persians, of the Greeks, and the Mu'tazila found in him for his personality traits, for a lot of reasons, a perfect person to start talking to. And they did. And when he became Khalifa Ikhwani, he made the Mu'tazila, and he upgraded them, and he made them part of his ruling party. So back then the Khalifa would sit on a particular chair, and the ruling party, the ministers would sit by his side. And he made the Mu'tazila to be amongst his ruling party. The people who decide the matters, the people who rule the country. <coughs> And the moment that these Mu'tazila came to power, they started their biggest fitna in Baghdad. How old was Imam Ahmad rahimahullah? We said from the age of 16 to 35, gaining knowledge. From the age of 35 to 40, writing his book. From the age of 40 to about 50, 55, teaching his students, touring the Muslim world, teaching the Muslims, and so on and so forth. From the age of 55, that's when the fitna began. And there were so many fitan. For example, there was a fitna between Muawiyah and, and Ali radiallahu anhu. They'll talk about that. They'll talk about the fitna of, uh, they'll invite, innovate fitan in the aqidah, in the fiqh, and so on. And one of the greatest fitan that they, be, they innovated was khalq al-Qur'an, the creation of the Qur'an. Now today, if I grab this microphone and I went around asking the brothers who I've got access to, what's the Qur'an? You told me, what do you mean, what's the Qur'an? It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our creed. That's what me and you believe in. That's what we were taught by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This group, Al-Mu'tazila, began learning from outside sources and tried to refute outside sources as well as within their fitan, tried to introduce a new fitna that no, the Qur'an is not the word of Allah. Quran is a creation of Allah. 
And I'm not going to go into it, Ikhwani. Please. It's not worth my time or your time. All I can tell you is that our aqeedah is very simple. The word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Revealed to us by Muhammad, uh, revealed to us through Jibreel, to Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, preserved by memorization and writing from the day it was revealed to, to today. Not a single letter can be removed from the Quran. Not a single letter can be added or a single letter can be taken away. That's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Mu'tazila came to say that the word of Allah is not the word of Allah. It is a creation of Allah for philosophical reasons. Now, to, to me and you, that doesn't, it's not a big deal. Or is it? However, a'imma, great scholars, and the Muslims back then, realized that introducing something new to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, try to penetrate, even if it's a small issue, is opening the door of fitna and changing the religion of Allah. Where the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was guaranteed to be saved, and guaranteed to be protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ That we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the dhikr al-Qur'an وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ And we will protect it. Who said that? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. About what? About the Qur'an. About the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trying to introduce something new. As small as it sounds, this fitna took the Muslims about half a century to sort of roll over that page to move on. As small as that fitna sounds. Because it's not just the concept of that fitna, ikhwani. It's the introduction of something new into the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Into this perfect system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. To change a word in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion. To change a new concept, to add something that wasn't there from before. So Al-Ma'moon adopted that methodology. And not only did he adopt it, ikhwani, Al-Ma'moon now start to advocate and call on to this methodology and this new idea and concept. So much Ikhwani that he calls in his chief of police and he tells him, gather all the scholars in Baghdad. And Baghdad was the capital state back then. The moment you get the scholars from the capital city, the capital um, city of the Muslim state, it's like me telling you all the, all the scholars in Mecca, so to speak. It's like you'll think, well, that's the head of Islam, the head of the Muslims. The capital state, back, the capital city of the Muslim state was Baghdad. So the greatest scholars were in Baghdad. Gather all the scholars, except for Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and tell them, you've got three choices. Either the sword, as in you get executed. Either jail, that we jail you, or it's either that you sign off on saying Al-Quran al makhluq that the Qur'an was created, not the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine? So under the pressure, under the torture, under the sword, under the, all the scholars, except for four, signed off. Islamically, as long as these scholars know that the ummah will not have a fitna, Islamically, you could save your life. Although it's better, Islamically, it's actually better to, to hold on to the religion of Allah and even die in the path of Allah. However, you, whatever reasons they had, Islamically, you're allowed to say something as long as you could, you know that that fitna can be rectified. Four scholars remained steadfast. Who are they? We've got Al Qayrawani, Rahimahullah, and his friend. And then Muhammad ibn Ibrahim and Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Can you picture this, Akhi? Today, for whatever circumstance, the enemies of Allah gather all the Muslims. To introduce something new to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would you sign off? Of course we'll say no way. How can we add something to the religion of Allah that wasn't there? How can we take away something from the religion of Allah that wasn't, that's there? How can we introduce something to the religion of Allah? We'll never sign off on that. And that's what the scholars said back then. Then the sword was introduced. Would you sign off? Basically you're going to get killed. Death is yours if you don't sign off. If you don't sign off. And he's al imma one by one signing off, except for four. It's a fitna. And subhanAllah, one of the ways to purify gold, ikhwani, one of the fewest ways, if not the only way, is to get gold and place it in a very high temperature, under fire. 
What happens to gold? All the impurities start falling off it. If you want to get 24 karat gold, أخي, you leave gold underneath fire for as long as possible until it starts melting. And that's when you get pure gold. And that's exactly what happened to the scholars of the Ummah. A scholar would fall at a particular degree. Another scholar would fall at a particular degree. Then the whole scholars of Baghdad fell, except for four. Then al qayrawani they jailed him and they started torturing him in jail. So he signed off after a few months. Then his friend signs off after a few months. Then the only person that lasted with Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, under so much pressure and under so much torture and in jail, under, under force, he signs off to this fitna. Say whatever you want, just stop torturing me. Who remains? One man. Can you imagine the fate of the Ummah relying on one man? One man, Ikhwani. Can you imagine that the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preserved by one man? Just one man. This man was holding on to the doors of fitna, making sure they're closed. What's the big deal of him saying it or not saying it? The moment that he says it, one word, Ikhwani, then the whole country will adopt that as a sharia. Till the day of judgment. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine one man holding on to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where if you place him on one side of the scale, he outweighed the whole ummah? Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. And here he is, months and after months in jail. So they take him out to torture him. And they take him out, whip him, bring him back. And then one night, they tell, told him, come. Or one day, Afan, they told him, go, that Al Ma'mun wants to see you. Al Ma'mun was a Khalifa. So on the way to the Ma'mun, he's handcuffed. Imagine a great scholar of Islam. Imagine you've just spent 20 years of your life walking on foot for the religion of Allah. Imagine you spent the next 20 years teaching people in the path of Allah. And this is how you get rewarded. You're handcuffed. You're being dragged on the streets. And he comes, an Arabian man, Bedouin man. They told him, see that man being dragged? That's Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Everyone knew about him, but no one can help him. So the Arabian, Bedouin man, ignorant man. However, he had more, yani, more advice to give Ahmad than more, most of the scholars back then. He grabbed Ahmad ibn Hanbal and he shook him. And he told him, Ya Imam, Ya Imam, Lam yabqa ahad, no one is holding on to the religion of Allah as much as you. Hold on to the religion of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you immersely for what you're doing. And here he is holding on to the religion of Allah. And he start, and Imam Ahmad rahimahullah began to cry. What a fitna. Who's torturing you, Muslims? What are they trying to do? They're trying to introduce a new concept into Islam that wasn't there. Is it little? Is it big? Is it small? Ikhwani, when you grab the Qur'an and open it, appreciate that every word was revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not, word, not a letter was added, not a letter was taken away. When you open up the Kitab of Sunnah, a book of Sunnah, a book of Hadith, when you hear that, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, appreciate that every letter you're about to hear literally came from the mouth of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Appreciate that, Akhi. It didn't come on a road of roses. It came on the back of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah as he was being whipped in the jails of the Abbasiyyin. That was the condition of the Ummah. And Ikhwan, I say this, how similar is it to today? Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that a time will come, a time will come, like today, where al-mumsiku ala deenihi, the one that's holding on on his religion, it's like a person holding on to a coal of fire. Why are you going to the mosque so much? Your dad asks you. Your wife complains, why are you going to the mosque so much? Why are you paying zakat? We need the money. We could do this and that with it. Why don't you buy us, you know, a house in mortgage? Why don't you, you know, work at that particular job in the haram? And people don't care. Holding on to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time of Zufachi. And he's the Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, been ordered by the Ma'mun to come. And he's in, is standing handcuffed. 
held like a prisoner. Where in the Muslim state? And who's in front of him? Al Ma'moon. And the Ma'moon, in front of his ministers, in front of all the people, said, I swear by Allah, if you do not answer me by tonight and say that the Quran was created, say, answer, and sign off on the fact that the, on the saying that we're saying that the Quran was created, you'll be executed. <coughs> so, what did Al Imam Ahmad Allah, say? Allahumma. And learn this dua, Ikhwani. The Prophet ﷺ said this dua. Allahumma kfinihi bima shi'ta wa kayfa shi'ta innaka ala kulli shayin qadir. Oh Allah, protect me. In whatever way you want. And however you want, you can do whatever you want. Subhanak wa ta'ala. And Al Imam Ahmad rahimahullah is taken back to his jail cell. Night did not come, Ikhwani. And, that, and that, imam, that Imam of the Muslims, that Khalifa of the Muslims was dead. Who killed him, Akhi? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He died in that very same night that he threatened Al Imam Ahmad with. So come, now comes a new Khalifa to the Muslims. And the new Khalifa had to inherit all these problems. He inherited the, the issue, and then the people of the Ma'moon, the people, the ministers told him, look, if we go back on this issue, then the government will look small in the eyes of the people. Then it might cause a revolution. We have to stand our ground on this issue. So here comes the new, you know, Khalifa of the Muslims, and he's adopting the same methodology. And his name was Al-Mu'tasim. And he had a lot of good things, ikhwani, a lot of good deeds. Sometimes we look at a ruler, a Muslim, look at a good Muslim ruler, and we look at one mistake and we magnify it. And vice versa, we look at, you know, one good deed and we, you know, make it smaller. لا, أخي. Look at him, put him in the scale. Weigh his goods and bads. Al-Mu'tasim, rahimahullah, although he actually made things harder on Al-Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, in his time, at his time, at the time of the Mu'tasim, a woman of the Muslims was traveling in the non-Muslim markets, away from the Mu'tasim. So the non-Muslims took her as captive. And they took her and put her in jail. So she said, Wa Mu'tasima. Oh Mu'tasim. As in, oh leader of the Muslims, where are you? So the Mu'tasim sends a letter to the leader of the Romans in that city. Saying, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from Al-Mu'tasim to the leader of the Romans. If you do not release that woman, as soon as you receive my letter, I will send you an army that begins where you are and ends where I am. That's the power of the Muslims, Ikhwani. That's how strong the Muslim state was back then. And that's one of the beautiful things that Al-Mu'tasim has done. And immediately that Muslim woman was re uh, released. And he's Al-Mu'tasim inheriting this problem. And he dealt with it in the wrong way, I must admit. Where, what did he do? He increased pressure on Al-Imam Ahmad. So now imagine Imam Ahmad underneath, underneath all this pressure. After Al Ma'mun dying, he hoped that the new, you know, Khalifa of the Muslims would release him. If anything, now the to real torture begins, and Al, Al Mu'tasim brings the strongest men in the Muslim world and commands them, and he gives them the choice: it's either that you whip Ahmad as strong as you can, or it's either that I chop off your arms. Imagine it. You're this young man full of energy. You're about to begin your life. And here comes the Khalifa telling you, whip this man who's been in jail, or you lose your arms. What would you do? Look at the fitna, Ikhwani. Sometimes today when we see a fitna happen or an issue happen, and I see Muslims not handling it correctly. SubhanAllah, it's, it, it might be wise to yani, st take a step back and look at the situation, analyze it. Because we're not the first ones or the last ones to get tested with tribulations, with fitan. So he's Al Imam Ahmad rahimahullah being tied up on a rope on a pole, and the strongest men in the Ummah are whipping him. Can you imagine it? Imagine you're the great scholar of Islam and you've been whipped by the strongest men in the Ummah. So much so that it was narrated that the whippers will be whipping him. And they were crying from tears. They were crying with tears. And their tears would fill the ground. Look at the fitna, akhi. Look at the fitna. And Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, is making da'a for them. Can you see that? Someone said that he was released years later. 
And thousands, tens of thousands surrounded his house, surrounded his city. They all want to get to see him, get to meet him. One of those who used to whip him insisted that he sees, he sees him. So people told him, go away. What are you lying? What for the cure? He told him, no, I must see him before he dies. And he insisted and he pushed his way in. As he was a strong man, he pushed his way in. And he grabbed that imam and he goes, Ya imam, by Allah forgive me. By Allah forgive me. So he told him, who are you? He goes, I'm all, I was one of those who used to whip you. He told him, Anta fi hil, anta fi hil. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. That's the type of person he was. Allah. Imagine you were whipped by Muslims. What would you do? How much hatred would you carry for that Muslim? For the Khalifa? For the, you know. La akhi, la wallah. If shaitan comes between my, me and my brother, if shaitan comes between me and you, make sure he never leaves a grudge between me and you. Wallahi, if we could learn one thing away from Ahmad ibn Hanbal, it's to never ever have a grudge for, against a Muslim. No matter who he is, no matter what sect he's from, no matter what aqidah he's from, etc. Yes, there are differences in, in certain ways that we need to be firm on, which will show. At the same time, there's never a grudge. And he's always making dua for the Muslims. So much so that he was so firm, rahimahullah, so firm on his stance that after whipping and whipping and years of torture, Al Mutawakil dies and comes a new Khalifa. And that Khalifa dies and comes a new Khalifa. It's like he was, he was like part of the package that all these Khulafa would inherit. Four Khulafa Ikhwani, four generations of Khulafa. Can you imagine a new head of state and then a new head of state and then four of them? And the Imam Rahimahullah was in jail. Once, they used to transport him between jails and between cells to whip him. So once he was taken, he was being taken to a public place to get whipped. And it was a whipping place, a public whipping place. And they were taking an, another man back. This man just finished being whipped. This man was known to be a thief, professional thief. He would go about his business, steal. The moment he used to steal, instead of chopping off his arm, they used to whip him. So Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, they just finished with the thief. They're taking the thief back and they're taking Al-Imam to the whipping place. And Al-Imam, imagine being a great scholar of Islam. Imagine being an old man. Imagine being a man of knowledge, a man of wisdom. They take you to whip you like thieves. He used to hurt him. And he used to show in his face, it's like, he never used to say anything, but it's like, Oh, Umm of, of Muhammad, what are you doing to me? So the thief looked at the Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. Come back from being whipping, from being whipped. And he said, Ya Imam, Ya Imam, I've been whipped 18,000 lashes for the sake of the shaitan. You've been whipped for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So stay steadfast on the religion of Allah. You know what Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, Wallahi thabbatani biha. He did not pray a prayer after that, that he did not make dua for that thief, for steadfastness. And I say these words, ikhwani, at a time where steadfastness is so expensive. How many people are truly steadfast on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many scholars of Islam today are truly steadfast on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And after al Mu'tasim and the new Imam and the new Imam, one of the Muslim Bedouins. He heard about the issue of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. This man wasn't the most educated man. This man wasn't the strongest and most beautifully speaking man. But this man had a bit of wisdom. An old Arabian Bedouin. So he goes in, he hears about the fitna. So he decides and he insists on meeting the Khalifa of the Muslims. And they let him in. So he told the Khalifa, oh Khalifa, this fitna that you're throwing a man in jail for about 20 years and torturing him on a daily basis. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal it? So the Khalifa said, yes. Is it part of our religion? He said, yes. Did the Prophet alayhi salatu um, know it? He said, yes. Why didn't the Prophet alayhi salatu pass it on? That's when the Khalifa stopped. And then he looked at the man who began the fitna, a man by the name of Abu Dawood. He told me, Abu Dawood, speak to this man. So the man, he, he, the Arabian man said, addressing Abu Dawood, Ya Abu Dawood, did Allah reveal this? He said, yes. Did the Prophet ﷺ know about it? He said, yes. Why would the Prophet ﷺ hide knowledge away from the Ummah? He told him, I don't know. I have no answer. He told him, you have no answer, because it's not part of the religion of Allah. Subhanahu wa and based on those few words, 
few simple words. The Khalifa looked at that man, Abu Dawood, and he kicked him out of his gathering. And he released, and he ordered the Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, to be released. Ikhwani, when the Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, was released, one of the greatest and happiest days at the in the history of Islam. He died at the age of 77. He only had a few years before he died. What did he do in those few more years? A man who was steadfast on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man who called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man who gained knowledge in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What would you do at the age of 77, akhi? He was calling people to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and calming people about the fitna. People were telling him, that's the hakim, you know, that's the khalifa, that's the leader who jailed you, that's the leader who done this to you. He said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala straighten their path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them good leaderships. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them good people to work with. Akhwani, what does that teach you? If we don't learn how to let go of grudges, to clean our hearts every night for every Muslim, if we don't learn it from Imam Ahmed, who do you learn it from? These people just ruined your life. They ruined your future in knowledge. They ruined your future with your students. What would you do to them? He had the power to hurt them. He had the power to make dua on them. He had the power to destroy their state. And here is Imam Ahmed rahimahullah saying, لا خ... لا ضرار, لا ضرار. Antum fi hill, antum fi hill. You're in hell, you're in peace. I'll, I'll leave it in the path of Allah. I'll leave it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the time of Al Mutawakil Rahimahullah, one of the Khalifa of the Muslims, that's when Al Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah was re released from jail. And then he continued to teach his students. At once, he was teaching his students, and a poem came through. A person asked him, Ya Imam, being a sheikh, people used to ask him questions. So a person asked him, Ya Imam, what do you say about poetry? So he told him, what kind of poetry? So he recited a verse of poetry. He said, إِذَا مَا خَلَوْتَ يَوْمًا فَلَا تَقُلْ خَلَوْتُ وَلَكِنْ قُلْ عَلَيَّ رَقِيبُ Well, and you know, the poetry continued. You know, basically saying, if you ever, if you ever alone, one day, don't think you're alone. إِنَّمَا قُلْ عَلَيَّ رَقِيبُ But say that someone's watching me. Who was watching him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment that Al Imam Ahmad rahimahullah heard that poetry, he got up, left the gathering, went into his room and started to cry and weep from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and weep from the reminder that this poetry has given him and weep from the reminder that this, these words had given him and he reminded people to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ikhwani, we see a side to Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah that we haven't seen. We see the man who was very firm against, on, the, on the issues of Islam and in the, on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at him at home. His wife, Umm Salih, he said, By Allah, I lived with her for about 25 years. مَخْتَلَفْنَا فِي kalima. We never argued over a word. He's the most stubborn man in the Ummah. Not arguing with, the, with his wife over a word. How many times do we argue with our wives? Or with our kids? Or with our parents? Or with our business partners? Or with our work, um, people at work? And people at home? And people in the mosque? And people in the car parking? How many times do we argue? Here he is living with this human being for 25 years. He never argued with her over a word. So he was stubborn and strong and firm on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but on his personal merits will let go something to learn from him ikhwani and when he died rahimahullah after old age after sicknesses after diseases here he is al-imam Ahmad rahimahullah dying and the whole ummah goes to bury him so much so that they say hundreds of thousands went to bury him Pray on him and bury him. That, that they couldn't pray on him one, as one group. They had to pray on him in groups, one after the other. And there goes, and he passes away, rahimahullah, at the age of 77 in Baghdad. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make people and to send us people like Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. And ikhwani, we're not here to talk about a story of a man. But we're talking about a legacy that a man left behind him. The legacy and the way of dialogue. The way of respecting each other. 
the way of having ham for the ummah, love for the ummah, care for the ummah, the way of forgiving people, even if they hurt you in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way and the legacy of gaining knowledge, ikhwani. Oh Wallahi, as much as we talk about this man, we'll never give him his justice. However, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that didn't allow us to see him in this world, allow us to see him in the hereafter. And I'll finish off by an incident to, that took place with a man that loved Al Imam Ahmad. Rahimahullah. Just like me and you, we heard about Al Imam Ahmad. This man heard about Al Imam Ahmad. And once Al Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, as he was traveling between the cities and between the towns, people have heard about him. People have read his books. People have seen his students. People have met his, you know, heard about the fitna. People have heard so much about him. But people don't know what he looks like physically. So once he goes to a particular mosque, he's traveling, he prays Isha just like us today, and he stays in the mosque. And when the mosque, you know, everyone leaves, or basically after Salat al Isha, people stay, then they leave. He was the last man there. So the mosque keeper comes and tells him, Come on, let's go. Yani, please leave. In the night. So he told him, Look, I'm, I'm traveling, I'm a traveler, and yani, I just need to stay in this mosque. I've got nowhere else to go. He doesn't know that this is Imam Ahmad. So he told him, it's either you get out, it's either I'll kick you out. So Imam Ahmad Rahimullah said, okay. Packs him the bags and goes and sleeps on the door steps of the mosque. The steps that lead you to the mosque. So he comes, the mosque keeper, he's doing around around the mosque. He sees that Imam Ahmad. And he told him, you, didn't I just kick you out before? He told him, yeah, I'm a traveler. I've got nowhere else to go. And this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not even inside it, I'm actually outside it. So the man was a bit rough. He looks at Imam Ahmed, grabs him by the legs, drags him and throws him in the middle of the street. Can you imagine that? So Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, looks, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. This is just past midnight. He's looking right, he's looking left. He sees no one. He's like, what hospitality is this? It's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he looks in front of him and he finds a bakery. And he finds a little old man baking his bread. And the little old man saw what happened to Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Told him, oh, he told him, called him, oh poor man, come. He thought he was a beggar that got kicked out of a mosque. Told him, come, you can sleep in my bakery. It's a bit warm, I've got fire and I'll give you a bit of bread. So Imam Ahmed rahimullah, has nowhere else to go, he goes to this bakery. And here he's, he's inside the bakery trying to sleep, dressed, so he could continue on his journey in the following day. He couldn't rest because the baker, he was baking his bread and getting his bread ready before Fajr. With every time he bakes a, bre a loaf of bread, every time he mixes the dough with the water, he's saying, Astaghfirullah, Subhanallah, Astaghfirullah, 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 Subhanallah. He's remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So Imam Ahmed's trying to sleep and this man's you know, remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala enough to keep him awake. So he told him, Al Imam Ahmed forgot all his problems. And he looked at him and he said, Hundumata, for how long have you been like this? How long have you been remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much like that? So the man told him, Alhamdulillah, Mundu Sineen, four years. So Al Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he was a, you know, a great scholar in knowledge of fiqh, of hadith. He was also a great scholar of the hearts and connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he told him, Akhassakallahu bi shay. Did Allah give you something special that he hasn't given anyone else? So the man said, Naam, by Allah, Allah has given me something special. So I told him, what is it? Mahiya? He told him, by Allah, I've never raised my hands and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything that he hasn't given to me. What did this man do, ikhwani? He just remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Astaghfirullah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Astaghfirullah, especially astaghfar. So he told him, Anta mujabu da'wa. He told him, You're you know, a man that Allah answers his call. He goes, Any time I make dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted all my dua. Except for one dua. He told him, What is it? He said, I made dua. Have you heard of this great scholar? His name is Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal told him, Yeah, I've heard of him. He said, I made dua that I'll see him before I die. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, realized why he got kicked out of the mosque. He said, by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has answered all your du'a. By Allah, here I am, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. I've been dragged. Allah dragged me all the way until I reached you. 
This is the dua of a man that wanted to see Ahmad and Muhammad. Rahmanullah. With that, we finish Ikhwani. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send the Ummah scholars, sincere scholars who remain firm on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and sincere brothers who gain knowledge in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and sincere Muslims who uphold and, up and die, live and die in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us and the Muslims. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وارحم الوحيدين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين والله have mercy on the Muslims يا رب العالمين والله be with our brothers and sisters in Syria يا رب العالمين والله protect them from the طاغية يا رب العالمين والله safeguard their lives Ya Rabbi, safeguard their lives. Ya Allah, protect them and protect their lands, Ya Rabbi Al-Alameen. And protect the Muslims wherever they are. Allahumma radda lana aqsana wa aqsal muslimin. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-musaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa jazakum la khair. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.